And it's much more prevalent since the wireless revolution got going in the late 1990s. In other words, the generation that grew up with cell phones have much more of it. When I grew up in the 50s and 60s, children weren't anxious. They never had insomnia. They didn't have ADHD. They weren't autistic in large numbers. It's very much a a disease of an environmental uh, illness. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. There are lots of things we're exposed to that we are concerned may impact our health negatively. Air pollution, glyphosate in our food heavy metal exposure, and more. But electricity doesn't usually make the list. For the last two centuries, we have pretty much accepted the notion that electricity is safe for us and the planet. But what if it is not? What if not only electricity, but other non-native electromagnetic fields are actually disrupting our health and normal body functions? This is episode 272, and our guest today is Arthur Furstenberg. Arthur is a scientist, journalist, and the author of The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life. Today, Arthur challenges our presuppositions and makes a compelling case that our electric environment is interfering with us. Because after all, we are electric beings. He covers anxiety, insomnia, heart palpitations, and more, symptoms that we now call normal, and explains that they are anything but. Actually, they are responses to our overly electrified environment. And Arthur, at the end of our conversation, offers a rather radical suggestion for a choice we can all make that can greatly improve our health and the health of the planet. Before we get into the conversation, I want to invite you to become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. Support our work of research, education, and activism. It's only $40 a year. I know some gym memberships that cost $40 a month. So do join us, and you can actually use the coupon code WAPF10 so that you can get $10 off. It will only be $30 right now. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and join us. And thank you in advance. And Ancestral Supplements Grass-Fed Beef Liver. Grass-fed and grass-finished liver from pasture-raised cows is among the most nutritionally dense food in existence. This type of high-quality liver is loaded with vitamins, minerals, proteins, and healthy fats that support collagen synthesis, immune health, and heart, brain, and liver health. Our early ancestors knew this, which is why their traditional diets included the frequent and nourishing consumption of this nutritional powerhouse. Ancestral Supplements Grass-Fed Beef Liver is 100% pure bovine liver. So visit AncestralSupplements.com and order yours today. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Arthur. Thank you for having me. I just saw this really interesting article where... I believe either the Air Force or NASA, and um, I will put a link in the show notes so people can see this article exactly, were indicating that pilots are suffering from the radiation exposure that they're getting in the cockpit. What do you think of that? I just was emailed that same article yesterday, and it's got to be true. Now, it's interesting, the article indicated that they hadn't really studied the level of radiation exposure that the pilots are getting. But I'm guessing that from your experience, you would say it's certainly affecting their health. I would say definitely it's affecting their health. And that's both from knowing what goes on in the cockpit and all of the technology that's there and all of the radar beams that they are traveling in and emitting from the airplane. And... The fact that people who can sense such things uh, have trouble flying, period, because of all of the radiation in airports and on airplanes. It must be much worse for a pilot. Right. It said that they sometimes get, you know, brain fog, confusion, fatigue. And these are symptoms of overexposure to non-native electromagnetic frequency radiation. Isn't that right? That is exactly right. So let's go back to... Some of the things mentioned in your book, The Invisible Rainbow, you mentioned that 
Well, let's walk through history. <laughs> what was the first use of electromagnetic, non-native electromagnetic fields in producing some kind of communication system? Was it the telegraph, Arthur? It was the telegraph, but, but electricity was first harnessed and used in the 18th century, well before telegraphy. It was used in medicine. Oh, that's it right. It was used for electrotherapy, and it was considered a kind of a panacea. When they started uh, experimenting with it, they, they were administering it to make the deaf hear and the blind see and the lame walk, and sometimes it worked. But that's what it was exclusively used for in the 18th century, before the electric battery was invented by Volta. Wow. And so people saw it as a powerful tool. Were they embracing it? Were the doctors embracing it or were people afraid of it? Tell me what was happening on that kind of emotional or okay. visceral level. People were excited by it. They were enamored of it. Electricity, this new thing. Scientists thought back then that electricity was the life force. Even Isaac Newton thought that it was the life force. And so they, they administered it gently, briefly, to patients for a variety of medical illnesses with, as I said, some success. And that changed, actually that, that went on throughout the 18th and 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, when electricity became widely used for lights and for power, then it became a contradiction to use it in medicine to treat all kinds of diseases. So, so that, that mostly stopped at the beginning of the 20th century. Interesting. I understand why they regarded it as a life force, because in a lot of senses, we are electric beings, aren't we? We are, yes. People who want to know a lot more about that should read Robert O. Becker's book, The Body Electric, which was published in 1985. Can you explain a little bit more? My, he was one of my teachers. Oh, really in person or did you just read his book? I read his book and I corresponded with him. Oh, very good. And so let's keep walking through history. So the telegraph was a form of communication. So first it was the telegraph. And, well, first it was the therapeutic use of electricity, but then it was the telegraph, then the telephone, right? That's correct. The telegraph, telegraphy started in the early 1840s. Telephony really got going in the 1880s. And... Again, as more non-native electromagnetic fields were introduced into our environment, was there a, an uptick in health problems? There was. Even in the 18th century, when it was widely used in medicine, doctors kept track of what kinds of symptoms it produced, and they were pretty much the same types of symptoms that people who call themselves electrically sensitive uh, complain of today. And I don't talk about uh, electrical sensitivity anymore because it's more of a political term than a medical term. It's, it's, it's not a medical entity. The Soviet Union, the Russians, called it radio wave sickness. And it's not just radio wave sickness. It's, it's, it's electrical illness. That's what I call it in my book. I call it acute electrical illness chronic electrical illness. These symptoms throughout the century have been the same since it was first reported in the 18th century through today. I'm talking about headache, dizziness, nausea, and, and these are similar to what uh, airline pilots have been complaining of. Heart palpitations, weakness, insomnia, memory problems, muscle and joint pains, tremors, light and sound sensitivity, ringing in the ears, nosebleeds. That, that was observed early on in the 18th century. Wow. And as you're describing these symptoms, to me, they seem fairly common. My guess is that most people don't realize they could be related to the overwhelming amount of radiation that we're exposed to. They are very common nowadays, and, and it's considered almost normal. Um, yes, they very much related to the amount of electromagnetic fields we are all exposed to today in the 21st century, enormously more than several centuries ago. I'm talking about billions and trillions of times more than exists in nature. Billions and trillions of times than what, we, what our when ancestors may have experienced. 
Correct. When, when you're talking about microwave radiation, which is how everybody's cell phones and all of wireless technology works, the microwave background in the universe is enormously less. It, it's virtually non-existent. We've introduced a new environmental factor into the world. And in order for cell phones to work, for example, every square inch of the environment has to be irradiated with with levels that never existed in nature. We did not evolve with them. And as I write in my book, nobody that's alive today has any clue what it feels like to be without this radiation. This is why it's considered normal. The, the headaches, dizziness, nausea, heart palpitations, all this kind of stuff, insomnia. This is not normal. Wow, I'm just letting that sink in for a second. I think you're right. I think there's a sense in which we've grown accustomed to being surrounded by a certain kind of buzziness. <laughs> and yeah. it is definitely impacting us on a cellular level. But the thing is, not everyone expresses symptoms in the same way so that like you and I could be in the same room under the same amount of radiation and you may have more symptoms appearing. But that doesn't mean that it's not impacting me on that deep level. Isn't that so? Well, I, I think you would be surprised how similar we all are. We're all alive. We're all electrical beings. We all have nervous systems. We all have cardiovascular systems. We all have mitochondria. We're all affected in essentially the same way. Some people experience it first, and it takes more radiation to affect the, the next person. But if you, if you interview people, you find out they seem normal. They seem like they're walking around. They seem like they're fine. But if you interview them in detail, yeah, they're also experiencing some of the same things. And most people nowadays are on one or more medications to suppress these symptoms. There's, there's an amazing amount of people walking around on pain medications, on sleeping medications, on anxiety medications, on antidepressants. And uh, yes, they're not feeling these symptoms. Why? Partially because of, of the remedies that they're taking for them. Right. It's, it's getting rid of it or depressing the symptom, how they appear, but it's not necessarily going to the root of the, the issue. Right. It's, it's suppressing the symptoms. And people like me who, who don't take any medications, I, I feel them in real time. And I'm somewhat more susceptible than the next person because of my history, but not because I'm any in any fundamental way different from anybody else. Let's go back, because we only got as far as electricity in the homes, I think, that was in the early, was it like, when does electricity really cover or start to blanket our cities and our homes in the history of, let's say, the U.S.? Well, telegraph wires, millions of miles of telegraph wires already surrounded the earth by the 1860s. That was followed in the late 70s and the 80s by telephone wires, enormous amounts of them. And uh, for lights and power, didn't get going until the, until the late 1880s. 1889 was when AC electricity really came into use very rapidly during that year. So, yeah, it's, it's the en end of the 19th century. And, and the... Um, an important part of the history is that when telegraphy really got going in the 1860s, there was a new disease described called neurasthenia that nobody could figure out what was causing it, but it suddenly appeared. And with the same kinds of symptoms that people were weak, they, they couldn't sleep, they, they, had, they were dizzy, they were nauseous, all the same things. And it was, but it was very, very widespread throughout the, a lot of the world, the, at least the industrial world that, that had all these telegraph wires. Telegraph wires seem tame compared to today, but, but what people don't realize is that the initial use of electricity, like today you receive electrical current into your house over a wire and it returns to the power plant over a wire. In the 19th century, the early telegraph systems used the earth as the return. Instead, none of the current went through a wire. It all went back to the power plant through the earth. So everybody that lived 
anywhere near telegraph wires were getting exposed to these electromagnetic fields, and uh, this new disease came up called neurasthenia that for about 40 years was very prevalent, especially in, in, in high society, and a lot of famous people got it. And around, what was it, 1895 or 6, Sigmund Freud came and declared that this was a psychological disorder, and he named it anxiety neurosis. Oh, my gosh. So when people say they have anxiety today, we think, oh, they're just a nervous person. We would never associate it necessarily with it being almost a, a physiological response to their exposure to electricity or radiation. Correct. And, and what we call anxiety disorder today was not described in medicine until around 1866. But Arthur, if we're all so similar, why aren't we all anxious? Well, to some degree, I think we all are. And again, it depends on what happens when you go to the doctor and how they treat you and what kind of medications they put you on. And some people are, are enormously more resistant to it than others. It, it's just, there's a, there's a variation. For example, if you, if you poison a population with arsenic or whatever, some people will succumb way before others. Other people will go around looking normal for a while. Interesting. So I'm thinking back to that. What was that disease that the telegraph might have incited? What, what did you call it again? Neurasthenia. Neurasthenia? Neurasthenia. N-E-U-R-A-S-T-H-E-N-I-A. Neurasthenia. All right. Well, and in some parts of the world today, neurasthenia is still a medical diagnosis, not here in the United States. Well, my question is, I guess you kind of answered that, but did it stop after a while? Was there less of an incidence of it or did we just rename it? <laughs> we renamed it. We renamed it anxiety neurosis and then anxiety disorder. And, it be, and it's very, very common. Something like one sixth or one fifth of the population uh, suffers from it. And you know, what you're saying resonates with me because I'm thinking about children. You know, a lot of children are now also diagnosed with anxiety and depression and they're often put on medication, but you would think they would be perfectly happy. Like it's difficult to put my finger on, and I'm sure the professionals feel the same way, on exactly what's causing their symptoms. And it's much more prevalent since the wireless revolution got going in the late 1990s. In other words, the generation that grew up with cell phones have much more of it. When I grew up in the 50s and 60s, children weren't anxious. They never had insomnia. They didn't have ADHD. They weren't autistic in large numbers. It's very much a, a disease of an environmental uh, illness. This episode is brought to you in part by Bovine Tracheal Cartilage by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand sourced, nose to tail, organ meats, bone marrow, and bovine tracheal cartilage in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. The life work of Dr. John F. Pruden showed that bovine tracheal cartilage had unique and powerful effects on wound healing, immune conditions, joint health, and other conditions considered to be treatment resistant to conventional therapies. All of these conditions were immune in nature, with the exception of the wound healing studies. According to Dr. Pruden, bovine cartilage closely resembles fetal mesenchyme, the primordial tissue from which muscle, bone, tendons, ligaments, skin, fat, and bone marrow, the heart of the immune system, all develop. Bovine tracheal cartilage provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, immunoregulators, and cartilage building blocks that are now missing from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world left out. Coming up, Arthur explains how we are electric beings after all, and he describes in detail just how microwave and radio frequencies disrupt brain, heart, and mitochondrial function. It's time to join hands with the Weston A. Price Foundation. Membership is always affordable, only $40 a year, and a positive step for defending health freedom. Right now, you can actually join for $30 a year using the coupon code WAPF10. So go to WestonAPrice.org and join us today. And speaking of health freedom, we have a health freedom podcast track this fall. Every Friday, we're releasing podcasts with 
Andy Wakefield, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Del Bigtree, Dr. Devin Vrana, and more to encourage you to defend your health freedom and find ways in which you can be activists for your health and wellness. So check it out on Fridays and do become a member at WestonAPrice.org. Just click on the Why Join button and join us today. An Ancestral Supplements Grass-Fed Beef Liver. For most of human history, we effortlessly consumed the things we needed for strength, health, and happiness. Like the fertile ground that we once walked upon, we were a natural extension of this earth. In the modern world, we struggle to fulfill our nutritional needs and sustain a vibrant, disease-free life. Grass-fed and grass-finished liver from pasture-raised cows is among the most nutritionally dense food in existence. Our early ancestors knew this, which is why their traditional diets included the frequent and nourishing consumption of this nutritional powerhouse. High-quality liver is loaded with vitamins, minerals, proteins, and healthy fats that support collagen synthesis, immune health, and heart, brain, and liver health. Whole food, nutrient-dense organs can provide great benefit for those seeking targeted support in harmony with nature, much as our ancestors did. So check out Ancestral Supplements Grass-Fed Beef Liver, which is a whole food dietary supplement, by the way, that provides 100% pure bovine liver. Go to AncestralSupplements.com and order yours today. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. So interestingly, in your book, you do correlate, just as you mentioned a moment ago, outbreaks of illnesses with exposure to new levels of electromagnetic radiation. But correlation isn't the same as causation. So just because something happens at the same time doesn't mean that one thing caused the other, right? Well, today we have about 30,000 studies, at least, on the biological effects of microwave and radio frequency radiation. 30,000? Something like that. We have epidemiological studies. We have experimental studies on animals. We have clinical studies on human beings. We have endless numbers of them. When Zori Glazer was hired by the, the United States Navy in the 1970s, they commissioned him in 1971 to catalog the world's literature on biological and health effects of radio frequency and microwave radiation. And by 1981, he had cataloged 5,038 studies already in the 1970s. And and I've looked at what he's done and what he didn't find. And um, I estimate that he found probably half of the world's literature. So, that, so by, the, by 1980, there were 10,000 studies. Today, there have to be something like 30,000. And yet we tool um, along. We go about our merry way as if, as if we were impervious to this, this level of radiation and electromagnetic frequencies. And we also know causation. It's not just correlation. We have all these studies, experimental, epidemiological, clinical studies. We know the mechanism. And it's been proven many times over and long ago. We know the cause. We know the mechanism. But we're ignoring it as a society. We don't want to know. What do you, can you explain a little bit more about the mechanism? Yeah. We are electromagnetic beings, and, and that's kind of... I'll be more specific. Our nervous system runs on electricity. We're like an analog and digital computer, both. Robert Becker proved this back in the 1980s. 1970s, he started working on this in the 1960s, that the, what we now call the perineural sheaths, what was long considered just the packing material for our nerves, is actually a conductive pathway, and that is the analog system. The, the neurons themselves carry signals along their axons to the synapse and then to the next nerve. That's the digital component of our system. It's electric. Our heart, our cardiac rhythm, is purely electric. This is what electrocardiograms detect. It's like, Mm -hmm. are the conductive pathways in your heart working correctly? Our brain is electrical. You have electroencephalograms to detect the uh, patterns of of firing of your nerves. These are electrical patterns. When you immerse yourself in electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic radiation, you interfere with nerve function, neurological function. You interfere with cardiac function. You cause arrhythmias. In the mitochondria of every cell of every living creature, 
you have an electron transport system. The electron transport system is the last step in food metabolism. You metabolize your food down to amino acids. You break down the proteins into amino acids. You break down the fats into fatty acids. You break down carbohydrates into simple sugars, glucose, and it goes into your mitochondria. And the last step in digestion extracts electrons from the products of your digestion and combines it with the oxygen you breathe, and it goes along the electron transport system. Electromagnetic field, it affects electrons. <laughs> so it interferes with, the, with electron transport and interferes with metabolism and effectively makes metabolism less efficient and starves us of oxygen, effectively, because the electrons from your food can't combine with the oxygen you breathe. So um, sugars and fats and amino acids back up into your bloodstream. Sugars back up, you get diabetes. Fats back up, it gets deposited in coronary arteries. You get heart disease. Cancer thrives in anaerobic environments. So if you are effectively starved of oxygen, cancer cells thrive. So the modern epidemics of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, exactly those three diseases, are due in large part to the expanding sea of radiation that we're all swimming in. Wow, you know what comes to mind? It's as if our bodies were radio stations and there's static that's affecting the signal of the proper function of our station. So it comes across, instead of a beautiful song playing, you just hear, you know, it's, so it's messing up so many functions. And if only we could hear that or understand that, we might respond differently, but instead we get used to that sound and just think, well, that's the way it is. It's considered normal, yes. <laughs> yeah. But I have a question for you, Arthur. Can we adapt? In other words, some people would say, well, yeah, okay, you know, these non-native electromagnetic fields weren't present years ago, but they are today. And certainly our bodies have evolved and changed over time. So can't they just adapt to this new highly electrified climate? Um, the simple answer is no. Any more than you would expect a computer or an, or an electronic device to adapt to electromagnetic interference from outside. What's done nowadays in order to have electronic machinery at all is there's more and more shielding. But our bodies are, are number one, can't develop shielding overnight. And number two, the Earth's electromagnetic environment is essential to our health. So if you shielded us from all this artificial radiation, if, if somehow we adapted and grew all this shielding around our nerves and our heart and our cells, we wouldn't have the natural input from the earth, which keeps us alive and gives us our health and directs our growth. Right. The earth and I would say the sun, probably. Like we need the energy from both of those That's sources. part of it, yeah. Like we're we little battery. Sun, we, have, we have the sun, we have the global electrical circuit, which circulates between the ionosphere and the surface of the earth at all times and goes through our bodies. Doctors of oriental medicine, acupuncturists deal with this all the time, except they call it chi and not electricity. This goes back to the, the 18th century when it was assumed, when electricity was really discovered and played with, that this was identical to the life force. And maybe it is. It's related or close to what goes through our bodies and our acupuncture meridians that doctors of oriental medicine deal with. But I'm talking about the bigger picture that, that we live in this environment which supplies all the information and all the energy to give us life. And you can't cut us off from that. Yeah, such a good point. So if we could somehow shield ourselves from the non-native electromagnetic frequencies, we would also be shielding ourselves off from those that we desperately need. Correct. So because of the outbreaks of illnesses that I read about in your book, do you think our current health crisis is related in any way to this new uptick in 5G infrastructure and the microwaves emitted by the new antennas? You're talking about COVID-19? Yes. Yes, there is a relationship. As soon as you say that, you're considered a conspiracy theorist, but, I know. Uh, <laughs> but there is a relationship. The coronavirus... A lot of what's being diagnosed nowadays, and this is very important, a lot of what is being diagnosed as COVID-19 is no longer a respiratory disease. They're talking about bleeding disorders, clotting disorders, heart attacks, strokes, neurological disorders. They're talking about people itching and have tingling, like all of this stuff. That's not a respiratory virus. The respiratory epidemic 
that swept the world in December, January, February, March, that was a respiratory disease. It killed people by causing hypoxia. It prevented the hemoglobin in blood from combining with the oxygen you breathe. When that is combined with 5G, which is hugely intensified radiation over what we've been living with, with 2G, 3G, and 4G, 5G is 10 to 100 times more powerful. The COVID-19 prevents oxygen from combining with your blood, starves your blood of oxygen. The radiation starves your cells of oxygen because of what it does to the mitochondria. Together, they're synergistic and they kill people. This is why Wuhan, China started the epidemic. The first cases of COVID-19 were discovered a couple of weeks after 5G was officially turned on in Wuhan. The big epidemic in New York City of the respiratory disease became lethal a couple of weeks after 5G became commercial in New York City. The Diamond Princess cruise ship, where there was that early outbreak of COVID-19, had 5G on board. It was the, one of the first cruise ships to have it. So there is a relationship. But what's going on now is no longer mostly a respiratory disease. The, the respiratory disease affected mostly people, the elderly, people with diabetes, heart disease, other conditions. Now it's affecting young people, children, but it's no longer a respiratory disease. It's a neurological disease, and it's probably caused by 5G. Are there, are there others in the scientific community who are willing to explore this possibility, this relationship between 5G exacerbating the symptoms and the progression of the illness of COVID? There are a lot of people talking about it, especially among my colleagues, my, my scientific colleagues and my activist colleagues, but we're not getting media coverage. We're not getting airtime because there's such a preoccupation with everything being COVID-19 and anybody that says anything different is considered a conspiracy theorist. We're not even getting airtime. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing just because I, I, I know there's that quickness to label people who think differently or who have a different approach to what's going on. And it, it's really, it's quite sad because we're not exploring possibilities and ways in which we might improve our health. Like maybe if there was any way, do you think there's a chance that people might wake up to the fact that this is damaging our health and want to slow down the rollout of 5G? Isn't there a whole group of European scientists who have signed some kind of petition to, to stop its rollout? 5G, the biggest petition is the one that I am administering. It's the international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space, and we have 300,000 signatures from all over the world so far, including thousands of scientists and thousands of doctors. There also is a, in a few days from now, I think on the 29th, I think, uh -huh. there's an international day of protest against 5G, and that's being organized by another group, Stop 5G International, and that is also worldwide, multinational. Wow. Well, we'll try to get the word out. I, what's happening is with the podcast, this is an aside, we'll edit this out, but we can't publish this until way later, but maybe we can still alert our followers because they are big on activism and so are we. And, you know, it's funny because the Weston A. Price Foundation is sometimes looked at as just a nutrition group, but of course, we're very concerned about other things that affect our health, including non-native electromagnetic frequencies. So we'll put that on people's radar, no electromagnetic pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, I do want to ask you as we start to wrap up, because this is quite discouraging, <laughs> if the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, and maybe particularly in regards to their exposure to non-native electromagnetic radiation, what would you recommend that they do? What's one first step they could take to protect themselves? The single most effective thing that people can do to improve their health is to throw away their cell phones and never use one again. And I say this for two reasons. One, and people don't realize this, that, that the exposure drops off as the square of the distance. In other words, it increases as the square of proximity to your body. So since your cell phone is held in your hand, on your body, let alone next to your brain, you are getting much more radiation from your phone than from any antennas in the street, any cell towers. And the other reason 
is that my mission is to save this planet. That 5G, in other words, it's not just human beings anymore. There are very few insects left in most places on this planet. And this is in large part due to all this radiation. We just had, in the last few weeks, there are reports of millions of migratory birds falling out of the sky along the migration path from Mexico, from Colorado down to Mexico, from Nebraska down to Mexico. They are emaciated. They're dying because they're starving. They're insect-eating birds. There are no insects left to eat. This is interfering. And insects have much higher metabolisms than we do. It affects their, their metabolism much more quickly. It affects migratory ability of birds also. But these birds are dying because they're emaciated. Mm. So I'm trying to save the planet. The, the satellites that are going up, SpaceX is in process of launching tens of thousands of satellites. They're launching 60 every couple of weeks. And this is going to disturb the ionosphere, which controls the global electrical circuit, which keeps us alive and healthy. This is a, an existential threat to life on Earth. Arthur, I'm so, so the, grateful. The thing about cell phones is not only is it your biggest exposure, but in order for your cell phone to work when you need it to, there has to be every square inch of this planet has to be irradiated. Mm. The radiation is the product. And if, we, and if we want to turn the infrastructure off, people have to start, have to give up their cell phones. So that is the single most effective thing for our planet and for your health. Well, thank you for that advice. I do have one more question because what you said about the satellites being launched, you know, I find very alarming. Of course, there are teams of scientists working with Elon Musk and others to make this happen. Aren't they aware that they are risking our, the very life of this planet? They have no clue. They have absolutely no clue. That I'm looking for people that know, not, not so much Elon Musk, but his brother Kimball, who lives in Boulder, Colorado, and is a staunch, he and his, Kimball and his wife are staunch environmentalists, and Kimball's on the board of SpaceX, and I'm sure he has no clue. We have to start a dialogue with these people and start talking about the relationship between what they're doing and what's happening to this planet. It's very important. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for your commitment to doing what you can to get the word out. And you've given us a lot of food for thought that we can hopefully take action with and make a difference for our future. Thanks again, Arthur. And if people want to contact me, they can contact me through my website, cellphonetaskforce.org. My other website is 5gspaceappeal.org. Wonderful. Thanks again. Thank you. Our guest today was Arthur Furstenberg. Visit his websites, cellphonetaskforce.org and 5gspaceappeal.org for more information on the causes he advocates. And I'm Hilda Labrador. You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the show notes for this and every podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org. Oh, that reminds me, we have a new feature now. We may have a transcript in its entirety for every episode from here on out. So check them out at westonaprice.org on the podcast page. And now let me read a letter from a recent journal. Wise Traditions Rocks. I want to take this opportunity to let you know that I think that the Wise Traditions Journal is written factually, truthfully, and very professionally. It should be required reading in every high school in the United States. It should be a required course in every university, too. I am so proud of everyone involved in the creation of this publication. I love the information and education it provides, and I love reading every word of it. It's worth the price of membership, and even if the price went up, I would pay without complaint. Thank you for the wonderful, irreplaceable information you provide. It's a treasure. I've saved every issue. Christina, thank you so much. And you know, you guys, earlier I was saying that you should become a member. The journal arrives quarterly, and it's one of the perks of membership. So do join us soon. And thank you so much for listening, my friend. Stay well. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care.
Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.